The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Okay, so uh, I want to cover today on a very simple portion of Scripture. And you've all heard it. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, it's easier to say than to do, isn't it? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submitting to God is yielding and surrendering down here. Resisting is not trying harder. That's the primary mistake a Christian makes, is trying. When in reality, it's a more implicit trust that's necessary. So you submit to God, resist. When I say resist, you're actually putting up a wall, but not a carnal, fleshly wall. You're putting up peace. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. So it's like a shield. So you're going to love this statement. We live by dying. We fight by yielding. Now, let me cover some scriptures, and I want to give, see if you can kind of catch on to where we're going with this, because it's really going to teach you how to more effectively resist uh, pressures. Everybody's got pressures. The world, the flesh, and the devil um, has a voice, and that voice bombards you continually. And how to submit to his voice, his thoughts, his will, and his emotions. And you say, God's emotions? Yeah. God's emotions are the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the God emotions. We don't talk about emotions in church enough. We teach, even in our school, even in Christian schools, I've seen it, we teach little children how to think, how to talk, and how to behave. But when they go to school and they're being bullied and they're all emotionally upset and they say they have a tummy ache, it's usually not dealt with. They said, get over it, you know, don't worry about it, think this way, speak this way, act this way. And people grow up with a, a, an awareness of how to suppress emotions, but emotions don't die, they get buried alive. Emotions are like little, little minds that uh, can blow up more than once. So when you suppress something, all you're doing is putting it under the surface, waiting for just the right stimulation, and poof, there it is again. Anybody have any of those? <laughs> All right. So uh, I want you to listen to this because I believe that what God's going to teach the church, uh, particularly in this time when there's so much that's changing in our culture, um, he's going to teach us biblical resistance as opposed to this. And this was just very disturbing to me. Uh, when, when we did traveling ministry, and you go church to church, you get a flavor of what's out there. And most people think that if you see someone unpleasant coming towards you, you're walking down the grocery store aisle, and here comes the person, the last person you want to see. I mean, the last person you want to bump into. And the first thing you do, and I'll pay attention, you go like this. You put up a wall. You tighten up. Call it what you will, but that is a fleshly wall that will not protect you. You might have been doing it your whole life, but it doesn't work. Because if they say something hostile, something negative, that wall is in your flesh. You put up and close the door of your heart. So God's not in the equation at all. You're on your own. You took matters into your own hands thinking you're going to protect yourself. And whatever they say, even, even evil words will penetrate that. And you're going to be slimed and you're going to take that home with you. Because you, can, you can't guard your heart. The only legitimate wall is peace. Peace is the only thing that really guards your heart. So we're going to talk about resistance this morning. But I want you to learn to resist properly because the, that carnal method doesn't work. Anybody can, uh-oh, uh-oh, there's Susie, uh-oh, and tense up down here. 
anything Susie says or does is going to go right through that and you're going to be bummed about it later and you're going to be mumbling to yourself, I can't believe Susie said that, I don't believe it. She, oh, she, said I, she said my hair looked nice but I know she was lying and, uh, and you know, it could be anything. But it, if it gets your goat, you've got the goat. God's going to teach you how to walk in the resistance of the Holy Spirit. To the degree that any Christian resists with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, you mature. And you weren't meant to stay a baby forever. God desired and wrote all of those things before you were born and the works that you would walk in. And when you walk in these works, and we want people to grow from little children to young men to fathers and fathers in, in Jesus, don't we? I speak to you, little children, why? Because your sins are forgiven. And at that stage of a new creation, God is for me. And you know, quite frankly, you can go many years and never really get that truth in you. He is for you. And you need the Father's love more than anything. I speak to you, little children, because you've known the Father who is from the beginning. And your sins are forgiven. We traveled to um, churches that were, had great leaders, but when it came down to the practical, they could say the right answer, but not necessarily perform the right answer. They could say, yes, I know Jesus, I walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But we ran into scores and scores of people in every church that could not forgive properly from the heart. Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. So little children, your sins are forgiven, but you're still a little child if you don't even know how it operates from the heart. When I married Jennifer, wonderful scholar, but she said, there's somebody I've been trying to forgive for a year. I'm going, that's the problem then. You're trying with willpower to forgive, and you're forgiving from the head, no matter how sincere Come on, you people that do phone coaching, you know. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. If it's not instant, it's not by the grace of God. It's not by the empowerment of a supernatural exchange or a supernatural transaction. When you forgive from the heart, Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. If you're struggling forgiving from your head over and over again, it is from your head. Because when you forgive from the heart, it's the forgiver in you and the new creation you that's doing the forgiving. It's a co-laboring. When you do something from the heart, it's the new creation you doing the forgiving and you're releasing it. And how do I know if I'm doing it right? Uh, peace. There's only two answers in this church, so if you're visiting, that's okay. Peace and forgiveness. And if you don't know the answer, just say one of those and you'll probably be right. But we learned as we travel church to church that something as simple as forgiveness. Some Christians are not, no matter how much Bible you know, and no matter how many years you've been in church, you're not going to mature if forgiveness isn't. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. It should flow like a river. There should not be this, well, i got to work on that. Well, let me think about it. I'm not ready to deal with that. That's all baby talk. That's kindergarten Christianity. You're going to wait and deal with it, what, after you have your little temper tantrum? I'm speaking from experience because I thought when I had a temper tantrum as a young Christian that I was just showing God how serious I was about this issue and that my temper tantrum would somehow enhance my position. But it doesn't work that way. It prolongs it. It fortifies it. It actually makes you worse. Punching a pillow does not release pressure. It fortifies your anger. It's like a muscle. You're exercising it. Submit to God, resist, and he will flee. Now, I'm going to cover uh, a number of scriptures that, uh, that the Lord used to train me in the early days uh, <clears throat> on how to properly resist the pressures of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it's out there all the time, and it's, it's there. And it wants to shape you and mold you according to its voice. But there's a, there's a voice that comes from the world. There's a voice that comes from religion. There's a voice that comes from the devil. But there's a voice that comes from God. And to know the distinctive difference, you need to know his nature. You need to know his presence. And so uh, listen to this. I, I speak to you, little children, 
for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So his ministry then was at what we would call the mother-father level, extremely mature, to where his suffering was for the benefit of others. A child suffers just trying to resist sin. Can you see the difference? Suffering, I bring about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus that life might be ministered to you. There's no real anointing unless it's passed through the cross. That which has passed through the work of the cross, that which has passed through death yet lives. That's what God has for you as a believer, to walk in that kind of an anointing. But I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. If you don't even know how to do that, you're going to have to, you're going to really slow the progress of what we would call third level Christianity. First level is your sins are forgiven and the Father loves you. Some people have taken their whole life just to believe and experience, not just believe in their head, but experience the love that the Father has for them. Um, <clears throat> My personal experience was <clears throat> you can't use your past as an excuse either. My father was uh, illegitimate, and my grandfather was so ashamed of my father being illegitimate that later when they, he had brothers and sisters, uh, no matter what my dad did in a way of accomplishment, and he accomplished quite a bit in his life, his, he would tell his father looking for that kind of approval, and his father would just look at him like he was invisible, and say, you know, your sister made a jello salad yesterday. It was really good. He didn't have it in him. He was in his own shame world, in his own world, to where he could not acknowledge my father because of his problem. Okay? And I was born. My dad did the same thing to me. I had two, two younger sisters. But it wasn't matter. It was like I felt like I was even acting out to get attention. You think kids ever do that? Yeah, yeah. And I was going like, he used to even pick me up from school and I would laugh because uh, when we were in uh, high school, we liked to walk home and it was a long walk. My mom said, go pick him up because you know, we'll be eating dinner late the way he hangs around after school. And so I'd watch my dad and I'd run to the curb when I saw his car and I'd go, and he'd go by. And then I'd see him go by the other way. And then he'd go by again. Then he'd go home and tell my mother, I don't know what's wrong with that kid. He hides. I can't find him anywhere. No, I only ran to the street and waved about every time he went by. But it was like, that's the story of my life. I'm invisible to him. And so, uh, little children, your sins are forgiven. And you've known the Father. You've known the love of the Father, and you know that your sins are forgiven. What I did then was to recognize that I release forgiveness. You can do this as a baby Christian. I release forgiveness to my dad. All that I needed and didn't receive, I am not demanding it from him. Maybe he should have. Well, he should have. But you know, now when I look back on it, even rationally, he couldn't give something he didn't have himself, right? He never got it. But the most beautiful part is you get your needs met righteously. You don't pull on people to get your needs met. And God taught me that forgiveness was what set me free. It didn't do anything for my dad, but it set me free from the demand and the expectation. Because you will transfer it to bosses, people, friends. You'll transfer anything that's not been dealt with properly in your life. You'll transfer it. You'll project it onto other people. So I released my dad and I released him of all demands and expectations. All that I needed and didn't receive, I forgive him. Once and for all. And from that point of that forgiveness, guess what happened? God started to speak. Not only did I feel the love of the Father, but he says, Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention. You're the apple of my eye. There never was another you. There never will be another you. I created you with a purpose and an intent. I created you to, to walk in these works that no one else can do but you because they're designed for you. They were written in the book long before the foundation of the earth. All your days were numbered. And these works were prepared that you would walk by grace in them. And so I did that. And make a long story short, 
after I started pastoring and I, as a young pastor, I had an altar call once and I said, for every man who never heard an affirming word through a male voice, I want you to come forward. And we came for, they came forward and we went to the prayer and I looked up and there's my dad with tears pouring down his face. Never heard an affirming word through a male voice. And it show, God showed me, you know what, it's time to graduate. Because I could have never ministered to him something if I had just kept spending the rest of my life expecting him to do something he was incapable of doing. Demanding and expecting. I'll tell you what, they're God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. And that's actually why I'm so pro-life. It's because basically those children are an inheritance from the Lord. They don't belong to the mother. They don't belong to you. They belong to God. You are a steward, not an owner. And if that doesn't get through someday, somehow, I, I hear the current argument now is, oh, there are many issues to vote for other than abortion. Oh, name one. Name one. That's as important as saving an innocent life. See, that's all silliness. And they have all these little catchphrases, but they're all, they're all so contrary to the Word of God. Life was precious. Do you know in the Didache, before there was even a, a gospel, they had a training manual that taught Gentiles. We have the book back there on the, the blueprint for the supernatural. The Didache, you teach it with Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament Scripture, but the outline was the way they would take these Gentiles who had ten gods, leave their little girls out in the cold because they wanted a boy, so just let them die, and they had to break down what we would call the Ten Commandments, but they broke them down into like 30 or 40 little intricate parts so that they would understand. Don't do that. Don't take chemicals to abort babies. Because even in that day, there was pharmaceuticals that were available for people who didn't want a child. They had all of these things, and they said, that's wrong. You know what? The, the, the theologians that I worry about are the ones that say they have a new relevant truth. I say, I want to see if it was apostolic. Did the apostles teach it? Is it in the book of Acts? If not, I'm not interested. I don't need any new revelation. I don't need to add anything to the closed canon of Scripture. But in the Didache, they pulled from the Old Testament, and they had to teach people. And I always thought it was so loving the way they taught the Gentiles, because uh, the Jews, as Jewish believers in Messiah Jesus, they taught the Jews to turn to the Lord your God, to the Messiah your King, and that He is the man and the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's true for Jews. But now you've got these Messianic apostles, these Jewish apostles, and they've suddenly discovered that these Gentiles can get saved and that their sins are forgiven. And they have to approach them and said, you shall love the Lord your God and they knew that many of them had ten gods. You shall love the Lord your God, the God who made you. Isn't that a good focal point to start with? And they discipled them over a period of time with character as the primary emphasis. And they taught against uh, all of the things that are being accepted in our culture now. They taught against them before there was even a New Testament. So um, I'd rather have what God's saying than some doctored up version that make, becomes relevant. We don't need relevant, we need accurate. Everything needs to flow out of the love of God for others. Now listen, when we're talking about resisting, it says in Isaiah 40, He gives power to the weak, and to those that have no might, He increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. He's trying to train us that there's a way that even youthful energy, and I used to watch uh, young Christians come into the church, and they'd burn out and they burned out sincerely trying to be a Christian. <laughs> and then they burn out, they drop out. The problem is they did not catch from the initial stage that God is looking to you to submit to Him, resist the devil, and then obey. But that obedience comes out of grace. 
And uh, I know John Bevere made the statement that they took a test in the average church in America, and the average Christian cannot define grace properly. I think it was 90 some percent, I don't remember exactly, in the 90s, 90 some percent when you asked them to find grace, they said unmerited favor or the free gift, which would fit into our culture right now. But the primary understanding of grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you. We don't talk about empowerment. Empowerment is the ability, God ability. I always liked uh, Joseph Garlington's translation the best. It was, uh, grace is the personal presence of Jesus in you. The personal presence of Jesus enabling or empowering you to be and to do all that he called you to be, all that he called you to do. So where's the empowerment coming from? Grace. How do you get to the grace? You wait upon the Lord. You, you surrender to Him that grace might be available. You consent here, but you yield here and obey. We used to make a little, uh, in the classes when we would teach on it, we would write C-Y-O, capital C-Y-O, just to remember that you can consent to all kinds of things up here, but it's not going to work until you yield and then walk in obedience to what you yielded to. That's the grace of God. That's empowerment. The primary definition of grace is empowerment. It's God's ability to meet God's standard. And when I saw that it required His grace so much that even forgiveness got simpler for me. It was like I was thrilled. I was a, raised a Catholic, and I, the only way I knew forgiveness was you went in a little box and then if you told them all your sins, guess what happened? Uh, you got penance. And you had all these prayers you had to pray, depending on how many sins you had. So guess what I did? I watered down my level of sin so I wouldn't have a lot of penance. Then I'd be walking home feeling guilty, like if I died right now, I'll go to hell, because I didn't tell them everything. Because I didn't want a big load of homework. And then I found out that Jesus, the forgiver, lives in me. And I go directly to him. And then I thought, wow, that's so wonderful. And then I tried it. And I went, i got to go to work. I've got bad thoughts all day long. I can't just sit there and go, I forgive, my dad. I forgive, I forgive. I'd never get nothing done. That's the way my thoughts life was like. How am I ever going to get anything done? I'm asking for forgiveness every two seconds. Fortunately, I stuck with it and found out that when it's done from the heart, the period of time between gets longer and farther apart, and you enjoy His presence far more. Practicing the presence of God, or walking in the light as He is in the light, and the blood of Jesus continually cleansing you as long as you stay in peace. Peace, peace that love of God that's on the inside precedes the peace. The peace precedes your walk and your perception, and that is by grace. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but I believe that there's a word of the Lord for the season we're in right now, and it's out of Daniel 7, verse 25. He will speak pompous words against the Most High and will persecute the saints of the Most High. So you're going to understand that persecution is going to come, has come in various forms, but that you need to learn how to let the peace of God rule so that you're resisting by grace and the only legitimate wall that's guarding your heart and your mind is peace. And it will guard your heart and your mind. And we've downplayed peace in the Bible, but you can turn every page of your Bible has got the word peace on it somewhere. And yet that peace is the God of peace shall crush Satan beneath your feet. Why did the Holy Spirit choose in the writing of that scripture the God of peace when it's talking about warfare? Because we live by dying and we fight by yielding when you yield to him he rises up and you're doing it by grace through faith yes it's a gift but it's empowerment they will speak pompous words now when I looked up all of the scriptures that pertain to oppression being persecuted being oppressed 
the world, the flesh, and the devil coming at you. Everyone had the solution the same. Listen, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He's going to persecute the saints of the Most High. Solution. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. People that know their God intimately will be strong and do exploits. So it's not about the resistance. It's about allowing you to be surrendered to His Lordship and the grace of God that is able. I think we've got to work smarter. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you're going to have to learn to work smarter, not harder. If you're busy trying, what you need is a more implicit trust. We used to use that in the, in the classroom setting to, to, to give you a visual of trust. It's like trust in the Lord is surrendering and yielding. Him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now, you know your heart is spirit, mind, will, and emotions. All of your heart. Trust in the Lord. That means you're yielding to Him with all of your heart. Lean not on this. No, it doesn't. There's a built-in warning right in the middle of God telling you how this all works. There is the warning, head people do not progress very far. And unfortunately, a lot of times, head people, right, Jennifer, are proud of the fact that they're head people. You want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God, you're going to hum He's going to give grace to the humble. Quit being so proud of your head because your head will take you places that are contrary to where the heart wants to take you. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. So lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge Him. Acknowledge is not mental. Say that to, with me. Acknowledge is not mental. You know what a definition of acknowledgement is in that scripture? Through divine, intimate connection. That's all here. Through divine, intimate connection, He will guide your path. You're going to be spirit-led. It's not about your reasoning mind. So a more implicit trust is to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, but watch out, don't lean too much on this. Don't figure it out, don't censor it, don't analyze it. You get into the paralysis of analysis. But you go to Him, and you submit to Him, and acknowledge. Acknowledge is a product of your spirit, not your head. Acknowledge means, and this is the actual definition for that word acknowledge in uh, Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Acknowledge Him is through divine, intimate connection. That's where you're co-laboring. One of the most difficult teachings we did, and remember, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven and you've known the love of the Father. There's some that still don't know the love of the Father and they still can't operate in a lifestyle of forgiveness. So let's explain. Who's doing the forgiving? Well, let's see. Scripture says only God can forgive sin. Is that true? Only God can forgive sin. But then he tells us, you must forgive or your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. The only possible way a Christian can forgive is if it's both of you. It's got to be unless you forgive from the heart. Who's doing the forgiving now? When you do it from the heart, it's the grace of God and your obedience to it. You're co-laboring. How do you co-labor? You only co-labor by the grace that He supplies from the heart. It's always available, but you can get caught up in here. I, I, I don't know why I should forgive that person. After all, I didn't, they, and you'll get into that. That accomplishes nothing except fortifying your issues. Do you think we need to move from children to young men? <laughs> I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven and the love of the Father. You can go church to church and there's places that it's so watered down that basically they have to keep reminding them that God loves you. I'd like to move on beyond the fact that He loves me and reciprocate. Huh? When He taught me intimacy with God, He taught me that first of all, Dennis, when you close your eyes and you drop down to my spirit, you touch me. And you're aware of that touch. But I want to take that touch and bring it into an embrace. I want to teach you to stay there. Don't get back up in your head. Stay there and enjoy me. 
And touch leads to embrace. And embrace produces something that words can't describe, a satisfaction. Embrace produces a satisfaction on the inside and it bubbles up. And if it's real and it's Holy Spirit, when it bubbles up, you want to reciprocate. Come on, has anyone ever loved you that much that you want to love them back? Of course you have. You want to reciprocate, but it needs to be the real thing. Not trying in the flesh, but having experienced the satisfaction that's in him, you want to reciprocate. And when you want to reciprocate, I can remember when God was uh, giving me that undivided attention, that I was the apple of his eye, that I received my acceptance supernaturally from him. I did not demand it on people. I do not need acceptance from people. I needed the acceptance that comes from God alone and receive it righteously. And when I did, and he says, you, Dennis, you're the apple of my eye. You're the center of my attention, and my thoughts are continually toward you. Oh, I never had that kind of attention. I never had that kind of acknowledgement. And God was saying, I'm thinking of you, and my thoughts toward you are more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. I pictured a beach, and I'm going, whoa. He's got those thoughts toward me. You want to reciprocate. But I said, but God, I don't know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to think about you 24-7. But I'd like to, but I can't. And he said, yes, you can. Don't let anything come between what you and I have together. That's intimacy. But he says, your mind, will, and emotions in your flesh, you don't have the capacity to pray 24-7 but your spirit can commune with me even on your bed. And in your dreams, there's communication. Communion and communication, the highest form of communication is not adjusting someone's belief, not training somebody with information. The highest form of com communication was, well, even Jesus said it. He said, Philip, you keep asking to see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's communication. He's basically become an expression of that person. And God said, I've called each and every one of you to be an expression of my word. My word is not just little scripture verses. My word is he is the word, and he wants to express himself through that nature. You need to take that word and become a partaker of that divine nature. But we've got to grow out of this children's level. Christ is for me. That's wonderful, but you know what? At some point in time, you're going to have to change it from me. You, Christianity can be almost entirely about you. Jesus loves me. He told me. His thoughts are continually toward me. I could stay there forever, but if you really want to reciprocate, if you're really going to acknowledge him through divine intimate connection, if you're going to acknowledge him, you're going to want to be the young man. What did he say in 1 John to the young men? I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong, and you've overcome the wicked one. Have you ever... I don't know about you, but I wouldn't go to a depressed person who's living below victory level and ask them to pray for me. Right? I, I want someone that's in victory, someone who's overcome the enemy in their own life. Wouldn't you? I want to go to someone that's, that's walking in that reality. And I want to pray this right now, too, because I believe there are people ready to graduate that haven't. Galatians 2.20 is the young man. Galatians 2.20 basically says, It is no longer I who live, but Jesus the Messiah in me. If it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, there's a corporate union there, isn't there? We're going to graduate. We're going to move out of it's all about me and Jesus loves me. The children sing that. This little... Jesus loves me, yes, I know, because the Bible tells me so. Well, that's not good enough. You need to have a, a real legitimate experience of that Bible and that living word. So he's saying, okay, then, for the child, it's all about me. I know I'm forgiven. I might even have to learn some self proper, healthy self-love. If you look at uh, Revelations 12, 11, it's like, I can see the three levels of the child, the young man, and the father. 
It says, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. There's your child. Your sins are forgiven. The word of the testimony. That's the young man and young woman. We ready to graduate. If there's anyone watching and you're watching, uh, there's always more watching than there are in the room. Last week's message, it was at least a thousand views. And I'm hoping that they take that to heart and even get the CD that's got the music on it to even enhance that worship experience. But uh, I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong. You've overcome the wicked one. And here was the exact phrase that, that, that really changed my appreciation of that at the stage when I felt that was necessary to grow in. God used the term, it is no longer I who live. This is where you go from head, individual, self-effort. It is no longer I who lives suggests it's no longer I who love. Can we validate that scripturally? It's no longer I who love. Well, who, we love because he first loved us. So any genuine forgiveness, any genuine love must be a co-laboring. It must be by the grace of God. It's not something God's going to do independent of us, and it's not something we can do independent of God. If that would become revelatory to the average believer, they would walk in far more grace, far more empowerment, and they would mature quicker. There's no instant maturity, but you can grow through a, a definite work of the cross and graduate. So I'm going to speak to the little children. It's time that you walked in a proficiency of forgiveness. No experientially the love of the Father that far surpasses mere knowledge, but move into the next level to where you basically are saying, it is no longer I who live, suggesting that it is no longer I who love. And here's the part that we saw missing in the church when we travel. It is no longer I who forgive. Do you still have to forgive? Yes. But what you are we talking about? We're not talking about the independent you, because apart from him, that you can do nothing. But I can do all things through him. Correct? So then, it's no longer I who live, but it's going to be we. Let's pray right now. Father, I want to move some from the children that are watching right now. You're going to move from childhood uh, revelation, and you're going to graduate. Now, there's a process after you graduate, but let's believe that we're going to move to level two, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And I'm going to move from it's all about Jesus is for me. It's going to change to me as we. It's going to change as me to we. I welcome the work of the cross to bring to death any any preoccupation with that Jesus is just for me and it's all about me and the world revolves around me me myself and I is going to be brought to the cross I'm going to humble myself before the cross because I'm going to move to a new level and that new level is that it is no longer I that live but it's a we I'm going to start thinking in terms of we so much so that when someone says you can't do that you say yes I can because the I that we're talking about is the new creation you. It's that infused, they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That's the real you. The independent you is the one that gets you in trouble. When it's, it comes out from apart from God to try to accomplish something for God. This is God. Isn't that interesting that they put those two scriptures together in Philippians 2? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then I see people going like this. They're going to work out their salvation in fear and trembling. No, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do. And when we've counseled people, you prayer coaches know this, a lot of times people, they either want to do it in the flesh for God, or they want God to do it while they watch. Did you ever notice that? Come on. You've, you've had people on, on the phone that they call like that. Well, can't God just go forgive that person for me? Yeah, but it's, this is a co-laboring. This is you yielding your will to the will of the Father, which allows grace or the empowerment. For it is God who is at work both to will and to do. But that doesn't translate... It is God who is at work in me. We have to forget that, can't forget that it's in me. 
to will and to do does not mean that I stand there and go, okay, God, you do it. We're always looking for a way to be an independent self. And it's got to change in the church too. When you read the scripture, you read it in the context of we, not me. God is speaking and his word, and I'm a we. I am joined to together with the Lord. I'm a young man, a young woman, and the word of God abides in me strong. doesn't mean it's in my head memorized. It means the word of God has been written on the tablet of my heart, and I've become an expression of that word. <laughs> now it's all of a sudden Christ in me as me, and I'm changing from me to we. Uh, uh, I'm starting to see now that forgiveness is not just the blood that covers, but rather the word of my testimony. The word of my testimony means it's actually working in my life. I'm not perfected yet, but here's something that's real. And let that be an expression. And the third level, fathers. I speak to you, fathers, because you've known him who was from the beginning. When you've known him who was from the beginning, you enter into what the Apostle Paul said, how I labor that Christ be formed in you, death worketh in me so that life might work in you. His suffering was not against sin. That's for children. He wasn't just busy suffering again, fighting against sin in his life. He was basically saying, any suffering that I do, there's a release of God's compassion that's flowing out to others. Yes, death is working in me, but life is working in these people. There's a price to pay. Remember, Catherine Coleman said, it'll cost you everything. But then what do you have? That's not his. In moving into a fatherhood concept, it would be like this. And, and, you, and you never lose the fact of childlike that God loves me and he cares about me specifically. That'll never go away. But you do have to get beyond that, don't you? There's things that little baby does that's cute, but if I saw a teenager do it, I'd say, oh, that's gross, right? <laughs> you have an anticipation that growth produces something different, and maturity is, is uh, uh, going to change you. But it would be like, give an example, we'll make it real simple. The child is over here, and he's going, oh, Jesus, I'm late for church. Uh, give me a parking place real close to the door. Oh, then you get a parking place close to the door. You Oh, is that, that's, that's Christianity 101. Oh, is that wonderful. And God will do stuff like that, won't he? Then you get the young man or the young woman. Now, this applied more up north than here. It would, probably wouldn't even identify with my example. But I can remember the young men that were hungry for God and living, living for the truth. And they, they would go and not look for a parking place for their convenience. That's the child. The young man said, I'm going early and I'm going to shovel the snow for the pastor so that people coming in don't get all messed up walking in the door. Is that a little different mindset than, give me a nice place. I hope somebody shovel the snow so I don't get my boots wet. I don't even know what to do with it. Right? That's the child's attitude. It, does God minister to that childlike heart? Sure he does. But is that an ultimate? No. The young man has a better idea. It's like, I'm going to go and the word of God abides in me strong and I want to demonstrate and I want to be a blessing. Me and Jesus are going to accomplish something because I'm, I'm in this thing, both feet. And then you have the fathers, the mothers and the fathers, which is what God is in the process of, of maturing right now. Mature mothers and fathers are not running around the skies falling, skies falling. Help, help, help. Mothers and fathers would rather see, and I watch even named preachers on television, just as an opinion, but you can almost tell where they're at. If it's look what I can do, that's still the young man, young woman. But if they have more enjoyment over discipling and seeing their children, it's like, instead of you, I, I, some of you are too old to be playing on the swings, all right? but you should be able to enjoy your grandchildren playing on the swings, right? Shouldn't you enjoy that more? If not, we'll talk later. I'm not against you playing on the swings, but isn't there a difference? Isn't there a difference in the heart attitude? 
It's like saying, son, clean the garage. Now, if they're a child, what do they say? Why? And when they're real little, what do you do? Because I said so. You don't offer a real little child a long explanation. Jennifer used to do it with Allison. Huh? And I said, don't do that. She's not, she's not listening anyway. When she heard no, she shut down. <laughs> so you say, no, because I said so. Then they become a young man or a young woman, and you say, clean the garage. Why? Well, we're looking to get you a used car, and we need the space in the garage to put your car. Well, there's a whole new attitude cleaning that garage. Now I've got a reason. It's not just because I, I told you so. Now here's where the mindset changes into a third level. Son, clean the garage because grandpa's coming. Can you follow that one? And what was the first step? The first step in God taking me to the school of the spirit and teaching me how to develop intimacy with God. What was the first thing? Personhood and honor. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he's to be honored. What was the first step? I don't want, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your, your will surpasses my will. Your emotions I want your emotions, your mind, your will, not my mind, not my will, my wish. And to honor your personhood, I don't want to grieve, quench, or resist you in any way, shape, or form. In order to acknowledge you, I don't want to let anything come between what you and I have together in intimacy with God. Do you have that kind of a relationship with God? Because you need that. You need that to move forward, forward and upward in the things of God. Father, we pray in the days ahead there's going to be third-level Christians, mature mothers and fathers that are going to take more joy in discipling and seeing the young ones grow up. It could be your grandchildren, it could be your children, it could be uh, other people's children. It doesn't matter. The point is, matter of fact, God told me uh, when I worried about my family getting saved, he told me basically, you take care of my family, I'll take care of yours. You start ministering to the people that are open and receptive and you sow that precious seed the day will come. When they all got saved, they all thought I did it, but in reality, it was other people were brought into their life that led them. My dad even called me up and yelled at me one time. He said, are you sending the Xerox salesman to harass me with that Jesus stuff? And I go, I don't even know a Xerox salesman, but apparently it worked because he got saved. Father, in the days ahead, we're praying, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. You've known his love. And I have written to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. To truly overcome the wicked one in your Christian walk, you need level two. Otherwise, you're going to spend your whole life asking for forgiveness. <laughs> Why not move to where it is no longer I who live, it's no longer I who love, and it's no longer I who forgive. But I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. And here's something I want you to pay attention to. In the days ahead, when anyone says what you can do and what you can't do, when somebody tells me something for me, my you is a we. My you is not independent. Our emphasis for discipleship is John 15, which is abide in me and my words abide in you. He is the word. The word was made flesh. He dwells on We has to be the concept. So when someone says, well, you can't heal anybody. Yes, you can. Because what you are you talking about? We're talking about the corporate you. No, in and of myself, I can't do anything. But I can be used in any way, shape, or form that Jesus wants to go through me. When I hear you, I'm thinking of the 
you that is fused together with him as a new creation. We need the new creation reality to be lived in the days ahead. And the only wall that you need to put up in your life is the wall of peace. It will guard your heart and your mind. So, Father, we're going to pray right now that we're going to move a congregation as breakthrough believers. And we're going to receive the kind of anointing that breaks through into the third level. How many want third level Christianity? We've been praying it for years. I'm familiar with level two. And I know much, much of the church is still in level one regardless of their biblical knowledge. But level three, is, it's no longer even we, it's he. It's what Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear. My, it's all about he. So it's now it's not even a we, it's a he. And so, Father, we just want to be that expression, that level of the work of the cross to where it, it is Christ through me. Not just in me as me, but Christ through me. Sacrificial love. That when I suffer pressures, it's that God is working in me and that death working in me is going to produce life in other people. That's the way I'm going to look at all pressures. All pressures. This will, this will separate the mice from the men. This will separate the children from the, from the mature ones. All pressure, the world, the flesh, and the devil is, is working in me a proper response that life might flow from me to be a blessing to other people. We want that third level, that enthroned life. We want that holy of holies. It's almost like these three levels are like the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. We want the holy of holies. And it's that corporate one that can even enjoy the holiness of God. You can't in and of yourself be holy. Be holy for He is holy. It has to be Him in you working through you. Suffering for others. Now when you enter into these various levels, whether it's the child, the young man, or the father, it's an instant entry, but it's a progressive development or maturity. So Father, we just want to, as a work of the cross, we want to pray for people to enter into the third level, all of us, to enter into a level beyond anything we've known before through the finished work of the cross, and it's by grace, through faith. It's not effort on our part, but we're asking to uh, submit and offer, and this is the prayer that many of the greats throughout history prayed and entered into a new dimension of God. They said, I'm offering my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. This is merely reasonable service to give my life as a ransom, to give myself. And the faith that rises up is the faith of God. It's not faith toward God. It's the faith of God that rises up in whom I live and move and have my very being. And so we thank you, God. This is not a, this is not a church for the immature or the pablum. This is hard, and we're going to stay hard because there's a tremendous need for mothers and fathers because a harvest is coming, and we can't have babies raising babies. That just doesn't work well. I've watched that in the past, and uh, the revelations they come up with, the insights they come up with, it's, it's, it's unfortunately too cultural, culturally relevant. And I'm not about being culturally relevant. I'm about being foundation in what God has said from the beginning. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we want to change him. And we want to be relevant, but that's the tactic of the enemy. He works like getting the camel's nose into the tent. He wants to try to make you say, well, that's old-fashioned. Well, that's, old. that's for old people, or that's the way it used to be. All of that sounds innocent, but all of that is the, is the camel's nose in the tent of deception. You go back and see, what did the Didache say? What did the first century apostles say? What did they say in the book of Acts? And don't tell me that times are different now and, it's, and, and God needs to change and adapt to our culture. That's a failure on leaders' part to not equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I'm going to close with this. Here's what we're doing. There's a threefold purpose to everything that we're teaching. And we were known when we traveled, we were known as the how to people. But here's basically what we're saying three things. First of all, God wants to grow a family. 
there's a connection that you make in the spirit that is, oh, you're looking like this. It's even stronger than natural family. Jesus came, he actually brought a sword between family. There's some that believed and there's some that didn't. He said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus on the cross said, this is my mother, my brother, my sisters, they who do the will of God from the heart. There's a, fam there's a spiritual family that you need. This does not mean you fail to acknowledge or love your natural family. This is simply saying you need to acknowledge. What did the early Jewish apostles teach in the Didache to the Gentiles? One of the first things they taught them was that your mother and father can bring you into this world but it's going to be the spiritual mothers and fathers are going to show you how to live in this world. Big difference. Anybody can father a child. But to be a father is a totally different thing in the kingdom, isn't it? So Lord, we're just thanking you that we're going to move to another level and we're going to pursue that so that we have mature mothers and fathers so when the harvest comes, that we can equip the saints for the work of the ministry because the three things we're doing is one, we're going to grow a family and understand what that means in the spirit, not in the natural, but in the spirit. What does that mean? Grow a family, equip an army, and today was basically an equipping how to resist properly, how to operate in the grace of God, the empowerment of God. An army needs power and you need to be equipped in the power of God or the grace of God. Not the free gift of God, not unmerited favor, but the empowerment to be and to do all that He called you to be and all that He called you to do. And lastly, He wants to prepare a bride. And God is not going to wink at the lack of holiness in the church. It's going to be love, yes, as the primary motive, but love and holiness are going to have to go together. It's not one or the other, it's going to be both. And holiness means we're going to have to call sin, sin. And I watch, even in the political realm, it's interesting how there's nothing new under the sun, but we change the name. Billy Graham said that years ago. He said, there's no new sin. We just change the name and make it sound like something that's pleasant. I'm not an adulterer or fornicator. I'm having an affair. Isn't an affair sound a little better? But it's still the same thing, isn't it? You change the ribbon and the package, but there's nothing new under the sun. And even now in our culture, there's a lot of phraseology that's out there that's uh, <laughs> very pleasant. But if you want to know what the, the heart issue is, watch when they attack you and when they call you something, that's what they are. It's projection. It's mirror imaging. What's in their own heart, they will blame you for. Christians, if you hold to a biblical worldview, you're going to be called a hater. But in reality, we're supposed to hate evil, not people. Everybody graduate today? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying, Pastor. Don't try. Trust. <laughs> try. T-R-Y. Write this down. Temporarily resist yielding. <laughs> we yield and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.